early days of motoring, it was unclear how the car would transform society or how it would grow to challenge the secure place that railways had in Britain. Trains kept the country going during the war. Transport was nationalised in 1947 with the aim of making it more efficient. This presented opportunities for the integration of road and rail and for the modernisation of the whole system. Most people relied on public transport for everyday journeys. Services were frequent and fares were low. The railway network connected every town and most villages. People travelled in the knowledge that public transport could get you almost anywhere. Most people relied on trains and buses, there was a shift in interest away from public transport at government level. The 1950s saw an explosion in the number of cars in use, and new roads were built to accommodate them. Preston Bypass, which is now part of the M6, was Britain's first motorway. It was opened in 1958. While private motoring increased, there was a decline in the use of public transport. The motorways were largely designed for private cars, but they soon began to attract large numbers of heavy lorries, and the increase in the number of lorries on the motorway meant a decrease in the amount of freight carried by rail. These changes can't be explained simply by the forms of transport available. Legislation was a factor, and it was often surrounded by controversy. There were always conflicting interests, and governments were subjected to a variety of pressures. In the last century, the railway builders tried to control policy. At one time, 149 members of Parliament represented railway interests. From the early part of this century, motor manufacturers and the road construction industry have been making their voices heard. They have pushed for policies to encourage the expansion of motoring. Governments on the whole have taken the line that this is in keeping with what people want. In the 1920s, the car was seen as the key to the open road. It seemed to offer unlimited pleasure, a chance to escape. By the 1930s, the problems created by the car were becoming visible. Despite new roads, traffic jams were common. The increase in motoring was bringing society and the car into conflict. In the 1930s, the chief focus for this conflict was road safety, as traffic accidents soared to record levels. New roads were seen as the solution to congestion and accidents. As time went on, the situation got worse and the roads got bigger. Increasingly, the result was to shift the traffic problems to someone else's back garden. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, protests against new roads and heavier traffic became more common, reflecting both the ever-increasing scale of the road program and people's unwillingness to accept the traffic all around them. The authorities continued to tackle the traffic problem by building more roads, but more roads generated more traffic. People began to realise that a whole range of dangers accompanied the build-up of the car. Exhaust fumes contaminate the air. Local authorities like the Greater London Council now monitor pollution levels. The air is filtered over a period of time. When the filters are collected, the dirt in the air has turned the exposed filter black. Laboratory tests then analyse the dirt. The results show that people living near many main roads are at risk, especially from lead, which is added to petrol. It can cause brain damage, particularly in young children. Cars and lorries emit fumes, which research has shown helps to cause acid rain. Noise is another hazard. 
1970, a government study found that 40% of the population suffered from unacceptably high noise levels. The main source of this noise is heavy lorries. Stress is a less well-known hazard of motoring. Inside their cars, some motorists build up aggression which can be directed at other drivers and road users. The result is that many motorists suffer from stress-related diseases and many drivers who face the daily struggle in the traffic become victims of heart disease. More serious than stress is the number of people killed by motor vehicles. Fifteen people a day die on the roads and many more are seriously injured. Road accidents are a major cause of death for young and middle-aged adults. The cost of the casualties is £2,400 million a year, although the cost in human terms is incalculable. The disadvantages of motoring are widely tolerated because the car is seen as indispensable. There are now 15 million cars on the roads, twice as many as 20 years ago. One of the reasons for this increase is the number of company cars. The company car is a widely accepted perk for employees. But what is less well known is that the companies benefit from massive tax allowances. These cost the average household £75 a year. It's commonly believed that nearly everybody gets about by car and that the car cuts across the class barriers in our society. But only 61% of households in Britain have cars and ownership is not spread evenly. Nine out of ten professional households have a car about half the households of skilled workers and a quarter of those of unskilled workers. But a car per household does not mean a car per person. Only one member of the household can have first call on the car. More than half the adult population don't even have a driving license. And license holding is very unevenly distributed. The people who do not drive are more than two-thirds of all women, three-quarters of young adults, and more than three-quarters of the elderly. People without cars depend on public transport services. These have been increasingly run down. Users of public transport are caught in a vicious circle. When services deteriorate, people have an added incentive to buy a car. Those with no alternative may travel less often, cutting out journeys whenever possible. Passenger numbers drop and services are cut back still further. Bus services, which have to compete with cars for road space, become slow and unreliable. The average speed of traffic in towns is 13 miles an hour. Buses and trains can be an efficient way of moving people. Public transport carries at least five times as many people into central London as commute by car. Yet people using public transport have to put up with long waits, unreliable services and high fares. In many country areas, cuts have been so severe that a bus is a rare sight, and railways are only a memory, except where the mainline express passes by. British Rail is now largely an intercity railway, but it used to have a large number of local lines. The major cutbacks came in the 1960s, when Dr Richard Beeching closed many local railways, mostly in rural areas. When the beach enclosures were proposed, they were usually, so to speak, sold to the public on the basis that there was going to be a replacement bus. Almost without exception, and in fact I can only think of one exception in the southwest, uh, the replacement bus also came off, and within 18 months. So the railway went, the replacement bus went almost um, at the same time, and uh, huge areas of West Devon, North Cornwall and so on, were left literally without a public transport service at all, except whatever little local buses uh, might still run by chance. But the whole network of public transport was completely destroyed. 
The private car remained the only way of uh, getting about, and that was fine if you happened to have a car and have the use of it the whole time. But those who haven't have been put back almost into the Middle Ages in their isolation. I moved into the village five and a half years ago when I was um, expecting my second child. I've now got three children under nine. When I first moved in, I had, we had one car as a family and thought we'd be able to manage. But of course, my husband takes that car to work every day. Um, within a few days of living in the village, I decided to walk to um, the next village where the play school is, about two and a half miles away. I started to walk, pushing the pushchair. Um, within a very short space of time, a large lorry came along and I realized that whereas I could jump up into a hedge, I just couldn't lift the pushchair and hurl it over into the field and the child to safety. I was very frightened and I turned around and came home. Although there's still a station at Fenerton two and a half miles away, there is no bus connecting with the trains and walking is dangerous because of the cars and lorries. The local train service has been greatly reduced over the past two decades. Few trains stop there now. People without cars in the small villages nearby have no choice but to depend on buses. At the moment, we've got two buses, well, one on a Tuesday, one on a Friday, going to Honiton. And it leaves the village at 20 to 10, quarter to 10, and leaves Honiton at 20 to 12, which don't give you very long in Honiton to do your shopping. And um, unless there's any outings going on in the village, you don't go very far without sort of transport. People who live in two-car families really have limitless opportunities here. It's a very nice place to live. You can visit the sea, you can visit a city, you can get onto the moors and so on and take your children. If you haven't got transport, you're really marooned for large portions of the time in the village, particularly if you have young children. At the moment, almost everywhere in Britain, travel is a problem for the majority. This seems incompatible with an age of high technology. There is a theory that in the future, new technology will cut out much of the need for travel because computers will allow people to shop and work from the home. But shopping is a social activity for many people. And computers could create a new class of home worker, poorly paid and isolated. Better use could be made of simple, well-known technology. Before traffic became so heavy, cycling was a very efficient and common way of getting to work. Now the chance of becoming another accident statistic keeps all but the very dedicated away from cycling. Yet the bicycle is quiet, pollution free, and at 15 miles an hour is quite a bit faster than the average speed of traffic in the centre of towns. Recently some money has been spent on making cycling safer, but it's too little and it doesn't go far enough if cycling is to be made safe for everyone and to encourage new developments like the electrically assisted bicycle. This bicycle costs no more than a good ordinary bike. It's powered by rechargeable batteries, capable of doing 20 miles on one charge. It could be the answer for many people if cycling through towns was safer. But governments persistently subscribe to the notion of greater car ownership, even though there will always be a large number of people who cannot drive. Car ownership could be increased, but at what cost? As you add to the number of cars, you increase the problems they cause. Already there isn't enough room for those that exist. They are parked illegally, lined up on pavements, leaving the slabs cracked and dangerous. Pavement repairs are costing the country over a hundred million pounds each year. The ever-increasing volume of heavy traffic is pounding the roads to pieces. Motorways today are also breaking up almost as soon as they are built. 
As the roads and motorways crumble, so repair bills soar. Currently, they are running at nearly a thousand million pounds a year. Britain is spending yet another thousand million pounds every year on building new roads. About 25 acres of land are absorbed by each mile of motorway. The countryside is rapidly disappearing. Unlike Britain, European countries are investing in public transport as well as new roads. The new high-speed service from Paris to Lyon covers the 270-mile journey in two hours, far faster than any train in Britain. The high-speed train is a reflection of the French commitment to developing public transport and the country's willingness to back its policies with real investment. Some large and even small European cities are investing in high-quality public transport systems. This results in a spiral of growth. As more people use it, the system expands and improves. In Britain, most initiatives in transport are road developments. One reason why Britain spends so much on roads is that there is a powerful lobby fighting for them. The lobby is a coalition of pressure groups headed by the British Road Federation, which was formed in 1932. It represents road construction companies, tire makers, car makers and oil companies. It campaigns for increased spending on roads and opposes restrictions on cars and heavy lorries. As part of its routine work, this organisation lobbies MPs and civil servants. It mounts exhibitions and presentations for them. The road lobby collectively offers them trips abroad on generously funded study tours. The Road Haulage Association has represented lorry owners since 1945. The motoring organisations also press for more roads. Members of the RAC and the AA are sometimes unwitting supporters of policies in which they have little say. The RAC, for example, actively resisted seatbelt legislation, which since becoming law has saved at least 400 lives a year. Pedestrians are by comparison very poorly represented. There are some small unfunded local groups which fight for pedestrian rights. But really, pedestrians are transport second-class citizens. Little notice is taken of the fact that society is built around walking. More journeys are made on foot than by car. Yet every time vehicles and pedestrians come into conflict, it's the pedestrian that has to make way for the car. Pedestrians are sent up, over and around the traffic, down into dark and menacing subways. Small wonder that many people would rather take their chance dodging the traffic Public transport passengers are no match for the road lobby. Perhaps this is why the strong case for improving public transport has been ignored by most governments. In the past decade, evidence has accumulated from schemes all over the world to show that improved public transport benefits all sections of society, including car owners. The environment is cleaner, there are fewer deaths on the road, and more people can travel without the need for new roads. The trend away from public transport can be reversed, and in the few instances in Britain where public transport has been improved, people have used it more. The new night buses in London have been so popular that extra buses have had to be put on.
in south yorkshire, the transport authority has won more passengers onto the buses by holding the fares down for the past ten years. It also encourages people onto the country buses and rural trains. But the national transport problem can't be solved by piecemeal local improvements. What we need, first of all, is to restore the idea of a network of buses and trains, uh, local, regional, national, um, and timetables, and ticketing, uh, all integrated, um, all providing a network into which people can have access, even from the smallest villages. People very often say, well, how would all this be paid for? There are various things to bear in mind here. Even today, Devon spends about 4% of its transport budget, or less than 4% after recent cuts, on supporting public transport. 96% is spent on, on road works, 4% on supporting public transport. Well now, the most conservative estimate, there are 30% of the population in rural areas wholly dependent on public transport. At a national level, public transport would be far better if the proportion of resources spent on it reflected more fairly the number of people who use it. But the government is set on reducing public transport spending still further. One of the few new public transport systems to be installed in recent years, the Tyne and Weir Metro, is threatened with closure because of a reduction in the government subsidy. If this goes ahead, many of the millions of people who travel on it every year will be forced to use a car. London transport subsidy has been cut. It's been reduced from £190 million to £95 million, a loss of half of its subsidy. Many more people are going to abandon public transport in London as the wait gets longer and the infrastructure gets tattier. The road programme is going from strength to strength. The government is currently drawing up a £1 billion blueprint for new roads in London. Plans which were defeated or shelved years ago are likely to be revived. This has serious implications for areas where provision for new roads already exists. There are places, for instance, where land has been left waste to allow for motorway extensions. Where buildings have been set back from the street, it's rarely to make it look better, but to allow for road widening. The government has signalled that it's sympathetic to increasing the 38-tonne maximum weight of lorries still further. The railways are being treated as if they are just a drain on the public purse. There are to be further cutbacks in British Rail's manufacturing ability. Few new apprenticeships are being offered. And in the foreseeable future, the country which gave birth to the railways will have lost its railway engineering and manufacturing skills. One main line electrification has been given the go-ahead, but this is part of the government's policy of reducing the railways to just a few fast routes. This is being achieved by stealth, as lines are being closed down. And yet the establishment of an efficient public transport network is the only answer to a deepening transport crisis. Transport plans involve the allocation of very large capital sums and they have an extremely long-term influence over many aspects of our lives. We're now experiencing the results of plans made 20 and 30 years ago. In many respects, these policies have failed. They have delivered neither the economic nor the social benefits which were promised, and they have caused quite as many problems as predicted. The fact that these policies are being widely questioned now could lead to improvements in the future, but only if people keep up the pressure for better transport and if there is a change of attitude at government level.